Uh, on behalf of the United States Institute of Peace, thank you all very much for coming um, to this panel entitled Blogs and Bullets, where we will be discussing the power of online media to prevent and ignite conflict. My name is Sheldon Himmelfarb, and I head two new USIP Centers of Innovation um, that are co-hosting this panel. One, the Center for Science, Technology, and Peacebuilding. The other, the Center for Media, Conflict, and Peacebuilding. And I'm really thrilled to see that we have filled this room. I apologize for packing everybody in so tightly. I hope you're not too uncomfortable, especially when I realize that this panel stands in that dangerous place between you and lunch. So, um, but it's a great panel indeed, as you'll see, representing four very distinct viewpoints. Time's short, and I want to get to their presenta presentations very quickly to leave as much time as possible for Q&A. Uh, so I'm going to set the stage just with really two brief comments and turn it over to our panelists. The first is to note that of all the topics on the schedule, for this extraordinary day of reflection on U.S. foreign policy and peace building at the dawning of this new administration, this is the only topic you wouldn't have seen being discussed eight years ago at our last Passing the Baton ceremony in 2001. Of course, people were already talking about uh, the Internet's transfor transformational significance, but it was only more recently when we've really seen its potential to both prevent and ignite conflict come to light in a way that no one can really doubt its power any longer. On the peace building side, for example, less than a year ago, we saw how a single posting on Facebook in Colombia quickly led to an unprecedented five million people coming out to protest the FARC, the guerrilla movement there. And at the other end of the spectrum, we've seen ever more terror networks like Al Qaeda recruiting money and people with greater efficiency than ever on the internet. Which leads me to my second comment, which is really a poignant footnote to history with interesting parallels to the present. Sometime during this past interminable presidential campaign, I heard a commentator refer to the shooting of President William McKinley. So I did a little bit of research, and it turns out the Pan American Exposition of 1901 was notable for two reasons. The first was the assassination of McKinley in the Temple of Music, where he was giving a speech. The bullet lodged in a very awkward place, and after unsuccessfully probing for it, the doctor sewed McKinley back up. And as you know, a few days later, he died from the septic wounds. Meanwhile, the second event of note was happening only a few hundred yards away from where he was shot in the Pavilion of Science, where the newly developed X-ray machine was on display. And in her memoirs, Mrs. McKinley noted with sad irony that the means with which to save her husband's life was so close at hand. Mm -hmm. And I thought of this story when I thought of our meeting today because it is a similar sense of irony that many of us working in the conflict resolution field feel when it comes to the power of the internet, that it holds so much promise for saving lives and promoting peace if only we'd figure out how to use it for this. As we speak, Twitter and other micro-share cell phone friendly blogs are being used to tell the world what's happening in Gaza with almost minute by minute accounts from Palestinians as well as Israelis. The information is powerful, it's abundant, it's informative, and it's often emotional. As capable of inflaming tensions as it is of creating a better informed global citizenry. Interestingly, the x-ray machine, when it was first invented, cost as many lives as it saved before we understood the perils of radiation as well as we understood its enormous potential. So we're not strangers to the double-edged sword of new technologies, just this particular online technology. And with this, let me introduce our four panelists, all of whom have, let, have devoted a considerable part of their professional lives to the task I just spoke of, which is to say, understanding this new medium. Please hold your applause here until I get through them all and I'll be making a more comprehensive introduction with each speaker as they come up to the podium. To my immediate left, our first speaker will be Duncan McGinnis, Minister Counselor at the State Department, Linton Wells, Force Transformation Chair at National Defense University, John Kelly, Chief Research Scientist for Morningside Analytics, and Ivan Siegel, 
from Global Voices. So thank you all for joining us here today. We've agreed each of the panelists are going to speak for no more than 10 minutes, um, which should leave plenty of time for questions. So please have them ready. Jot them down as, you, as they come to you on a piece of paper, the back of your hand, whatever. But have your questions ready, because as I said earlier, time is fairly tight before lunch. Uh, first off, I'm pleased to introduce Duncan McGinnis, a career diplomat, most recently Principal Deputy Coordinator for the State Department's Bureau of International Information Programs. And prior to this, he helped establish an interagency counterterrorism communication center to develop and coordinate communication strategies to combat extremist ideology, of which one such strategy was the creation of a pioneering digital outreach team that's been very active in the blogosphere and other online destinations. Duncan, over to you. Got a timer here because it's very hard to stay on time. Uh, Ten minutes is not very long. Um, public diplomacy uses the media, both online, what I will be calling new media, and traditional media, to inform, influence, and engage foreign publics. While a key part of our job is to advocate U.S. policy and explain the political, social, and cultural side of the United States, an overarching goal of what we do is to promote the values of civil society, tolerance, rule of law, free markets, and respect for human rights. These are precisely the values that are the foundation of efforts to prevent conflict, to counter violent extremism, to promote peace and stability. Public diplomacy has been described as waging a war of ideas, but it's actually more closely rooted in a dialogue on values and ideals, building bridges and promoting mutual understanding. At best, its activities illuminate the kinds of ideals and positive visions that do promote peace, prosperity, and cooperation. While these types of public diplomacy goals may appear to be overly idealistic or simplistic, I can assure you that the reality of putting them into practice is exceedingly difficult and messy, requiring down-to-earth, very pragmatic approaches in discussing the new internet media, a TV journalist recently told me, our audiences are no longer sitting on the couches, they're in front of their computers on their keyboards. It's a new world. A new media represents a fundamental shift. As people have mentioned before, um, it is not an exaggeration to say that we are in the midst of a communication revolution that has moved us from the one-way communication of traditional electronic and print media, where the content producers push information out to consumers to a new paradigm of a two-way and multiple channel communication between communities of producers, users, users, user producers. The audience is truly no longer sitting down. This is not, as some internet evangelicals posit, the dawn of a new communications nirvana. The same tools that allow civil society NGOs to build shared communities is also used very adroitly by those people who have intentions that are bad, terrorists, pedophiles, or simply con artists. Al-Qaeda was quick to see and exploit the advantage of distributed community building networks on the internet. I will leave it to Linton to talk more about that aspect of uh, the internet but note that we are acutely aware that web innovations are powerful tools for those that seek to ignite conflict as well as those who seek to bring peace. What distinguishes old media from the active, what distinguishes the new from the old media is what I call active audience participation. New media is direct and interactive and involving. It is about building networks and communities. These are attributes ideally suited to the development of powerful and effective track to diplomacy and people-to-people -people conflict resolution programs. I worked in Jerusalem in the late 1990s on the West Bank, and at that time, we put together a number of remarkable 
programs to encourage dialogue between is Israelis and Palestinians. While often initially very encouraging, these people-to-people -people programs generally languished because of the reality of physical separation that made it difficult or impossible to build a long-lasting, self-sustaining community of interest. Today, the situation is not con very conducive to people-to-people -people programs. However, the technology is very conducive to filling that void that was there and the, in the making it e easier for people to communicate together on an ongoing, long-term basis, virtually, where closed borders and separation does not matter. <clears throat> Public diplomacy practitioners see new media as, in a very positive light and as a, as a good new development and one that offers great opportunity to expand our interaction with foreign publics and to reach directly out to people. We do face difficult challenges in adopting our bureaucratic desire for total control of everything we do to the freewheeling world of the web. At the same time, we are enamored with the possibility it offers of getting out from behind the high security embassy walls and into the communities that we used to uh, deal with on a direct basis earlier. New media revitalizes that core public diplomacy principle that effective communications is direct and personal. Edward R. Murrow famously said, the real crucial link in the international communication chain is the last three feet, which is bridged by personal contact, one person talking to another. It perhaps is a strange concept for thus, us who grew up in the pre-internet age well, but when I am sitting at my computer, 18 inches away from the screen, typing to a Sri Lankan journalist who's sitting 18 inches from his screen, we have bridged the 10,000 mile gap down to three feet. Let me sketch out several examples of how public diplomacy is using new media to prevent conflict and counter violence. Um, last December of this past year, state working with private partners like Howcast and others held a summit for youth movements in New York that brought together over a dozen youth leaders of online movements from around the world to learn, to share, and to discuss how to use social network online tools to empower youth against violence and oppression. These young leaders agreed to form a global youth alliance to support and learn from one another. Sheldon mentioned the Nomas Fark movement which was the actual impetus for, this, for the putting together this program. And it was the success of One Million Voices against FARC, which was started by just one lone Colombian youth uh, that eventually ended up with 12 million people in 190 cities demonstrating against the FARC and against extremism that has terrorized Colombia. Uh, that model, I think, is a model that we should look at as, as a potential model uh, for devoting lots of, many of our resources towards. Uh, the Bureau of International Information Programs launched last fall a video contest for youth around the globe to capture their views on what they think democracy means and to share them through short internet videos. In the spirit of new media, we did not take this on and do it on our own, but reached out to the NGO and private sector community to a number of partners, including the Directors Guild of America, Motion Picture Association, uh, NDI, IRI, NED, Time Warner, NBC, and universities. This program it has only been made possible through the presence of cheap video technology and the existence of YouTube, which allows individuals around the globe to share their experiences and their hopes and their dreams for democracy on a scale that would have been impossible even as recently as two years ago. So, so we're, we're actually developing and using tools that didn't exist in 2006. Uh, we were asked to make some recommendations, so I'll make recommendations. These are not specifically for the new administration, but more and generically for the community and for everyone. One is we should use the power of web communications to promote the free flow of information to people living in the shadow of poverty, oppression, and helplessness. Information is key for people to be able to make decisions. 
Second is to build conflict resolution models on how to use social networking and new communication technology to turn people-to-people -people programs into self-sustaining, self-organizing systems that take off and, and grow. Third is to fund NGOs to provide training and technology to youth, women, political activists, and journalists on how to use social networking to build communities, to provide the tools to those people. And fourthly, I would say, make sure we do not neglect to those regions of the world that don't have the latest technology. And we have to make a special effort to develop tools that work not with smartphones, but with SMS messaging. So places like Africa, one with, who do not have connection necessarily to the internet, we can still use, there are still good technologies out there. Uh, a number of people have worked with SMS messaging on what I call plain old cell phones that actually can convey and mobilize communities. So I think I'm really at the end of my 10 minutes and I'll stop. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Duncan. When I hear you talk about what you are doing at State Department now online, I know this is not my grandfather's State Department. Um, and our next speaker, uh, Dr. Linton Wells serves as the Force Transformation Chair at National Defense University, I mentioned earlier, but prior to coming to NDU, he was the Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Networks and Information Integration, having already served as DOD's Chief Information Officer, CIO. But perhaps Linton's best claim to fame is having an article written about him in Wired Magazine. Um, <laughs> where he was described as a prime mover in the military's embrace of information technology, one of the Pentagon's geeks in chief, <laughs> which I think is about the highest compliment you can get from Wired Magazine, Linton. All right, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Sheldon. Let me see, start. Having said this, we are baffled by the timer. Okay, um, so the question here is igniting violent conflict. And this is clearly a two-edged sword. The power of this media can be shown on a very personal basis by the ongoing story about the teenager who committed suicide as a result of the uh, being bullied online. But once you extrapolate that a minute to targeted attacks against any of us, and particularly against people in leadership positions. Every year I go out to Las Vegas to the convention that's called DEF CON, it's the hacker convention. And this past year, actually last year a large part of the emphasis was placed on identity theft. How you can uh, you know, masquerade as somebody to uh, do all sorts of uh, bad things to them, mainly in this case criminal. This year there was an entire focus devoted on social software and what was termed a perfect storm uh, in the sense that uh, people are putting too much information about themselves online on sites that are sort of inherently not very secure. Uh, and by the way, we folks have been working really hard to develop some neat cross-scripting and other tools so when you think you log into your secure site HTTPS, it's actually being sent to us as HTTP and we're just monitoring and changing what you're doing as you're typing. Uh, and so uh, this is happening whether we like it or not. Uh, and now imagine then instead of having poor kids being bullied by their peers, that on the verge of a crisis, all of a sudden the Secretary of Defense's website, uh, Secretary of Defense finds out with child pornography in his computer, uh, his kids' grades are zeroed out and his wife's bank accounts go to zero. You know, at a minimum, you're going to be distracted from what's going on <coughs> with the remainder of the crisis. Okay, so that's one potential issue, is targeted attacks. <clears throat> the second would be cyber riots. So this first came to my attention in the EP3 incident in 2001. Remember when the Chinese, when the aircraft landed in China, it was damaged in the mid-air collision? Uh, and uh, there was across both sides of the Pacific, I mean, going from uh, east to west and west to east, there was all sorts of hacking going on. And we looked at this and said, I know we're not in charge of this. And, uh, and the other side was saying, well, we're not in charge of it either. And so whether each side believes someone is doing it or not, there are non-government actors in this space. And we saw this clearly in Estonia. But a feature of this is that because of the anonymity of the internet, 
the government can manipulate, governments can manipulate this kind of cyber riot with very little fear of attribution. So it's another you know, feature of what's happening. <coughs> The key point, again, for me is the government is not always in control of these things. And one needs to be careful about when you say, ah, this is the people who did it, or similarly, if people are blaming us for it. Third point is recruiting of activists and fundraising, as Duncan mentioned. <clears throat> uh, how many have ever visited a jihadi website? So they're, uh, <coughs> we're, no we're taking notes. <coughs> uh, this is being cam videoed, right? Okay. Um, there's a very sophisticated combination of subtlety and uh, you know, hammer and, and blatancy on some of these. Um, for example, if you look at the, uh, how many have ever heard of Martyr's Cookies? Okay, so a few years ago, uh, and I don't know if it's still up, I imagine it would be, there was a site devoted to the sort of training of the parents of how to raise your child to be a jihadi. And so it started with uh, uh, jihadi lullabies and jihadi nursery rhymes and jihadi coloring books. And I'm told, I have not physically, personally seen this, but people tell me, that this training syllabus ended with a recipe for martyr's cookies, where you would then bake the cookies after your child had blown themselves up to go down to the marketplace and celebrate the success of your training program. I mean, that's a very powerful approach that may be very foreign and antithetical to a lot of us. We can't deny that it's out there and it can be used. Um, motivation. Uh, so part is recruitment to bring people on board. The other is keep them motivated. Um, if you look at the websites that are devoted to attacks on Western coalition forces, uh, I mean, the, not only are they dramatic pictures of people blowing up and dead American soldiers and things like that, but they're accompanied by soundtracks of, of, of um, Islamic chants and things like that that you know, for people who live in that world give a very powerful message. Okay, so the third and fourth here are motive recruitment and motivation. Uh, the fifth is actually in the conduct of a conflict. Uh, there's a very interesting set of discussions uh, by a German on how he became a cyber warrior against Georgia. Uh, and basically, within an hour uh, of saying, I'd like to do this, what can I find out about? He had gone online, visit, found the, whatever it is, Take Down Georgia website. Uh, having gone there, he was now visited by a mentor who sort of said, well, you know, that particular website here isn't getting as much attention as we'd like. And he said that within an hour, he was fully capable of doing distributed denial of service attacks against, uh, against Georgia. Uh, is that a really sophisticated hack? No, but it's a way that people can participate in ways that just didn't have to, uh, you know, literally from the three inch, from the three feet away, um, uh, comfort of your living room to participate in the conflict. Uh, in a number of demonstrations, World Trade Organization, uh, we've been very impressed by the extent to which uh, the activists have used. Uh, flash mobs and cell phones and things like that to outmaneuver, in many cases, the police. Of just being said, okay, all the police are coming to the corner of 18th and H, let's go to the corner of 19th and K or something like that. Uh, and it allows a very nimble command and control in some cases. Uh, the counter FARC was mentioned. The use of Twitter in Mumbai is really striking. By most accounts, uh, the first reports of the attack were present on Mumbai like 20 minutes, uh, present on Twitter like 20 minutes before it appeared in the mainstream media. Uh, and you know, the velocity of information was just extraordinary. Which leads to an interesting point, is what you lose in this is a lot of the trust but verify uh, aspects you expect out of the media. Uh, in some respects, it's a throw everything out there and we'll converge to the truth over time by seeing what sorts out and what doesn't through the filter, rather than expecting this to be vetted posting by uh, your rational reporters. Okay, the, the next piece is highlighting and inflaming grievances. Uh, Sheldon mentioned Gaza. I mean, this is very, very sophisticated use of social media on both sides. Uh, the Israeli consul, I think, in New York has a, uh, has a Twitter feed that they're running. There's YouTube and Facebook. But even so, just look at the picture of the fighting in Iraq that has been presented to people who watch, on the one hand, Al Jazeera, on the other hand, Fox. You almost have no common basis for a discussion of what has gone on in this war 
uh, if you've gotten all your information from one side or the other. So in this case, instead of informing to a common uh, understanding, it's actually leading to a diverging uh, understanding. Another uh, use of these media is for posterity. Look at the Martyrs' Last Testament videos. Not just internationally, the Virginia Tech shooter who posted uh, his uh, you know, description of what he was doing, the Columbine uh, shooters. So there's a lot of, uh, okay, I can at least record myself. Uh, and by the way, others can now see what I did and perhaps hold me up as an example. Uh, we tend to think that the you know, access to the information in the world will tend to be a leveling and liberating function. But in point of fact, it allows for people to form closed groups that reinforce pre-existing views. And if, if I want to join my model airplane club, I can find lots of people who want to do that. But if I want to find a group of people who deny the Holocaust ever happened, or are skinheads or devoted to violent uprising, I can link myself into a world that will just reinforce at every online click the beliefs I already have. Uh, it can be a very provocative. So the, the bottom line of this whole thing is the governments really need to understand the power of this new media. The normal tendency of us in government is to kind of protect. Oh, you know, this is new, this is scary, this is, has security vulnerabilities, and it does. And so we lock ourselves into protected enclaves and deny uh, our people the right to use it. You know, the rest of the world is using this whether we like it or not. And we've got to find a way to engage. So a couple of last points here. Uh, there's a very interesting project called Social Software for, uh, at Security, S3, that's being run uh, over at NDU. If you haven't seen them, I encourage you to take a look at Mark Drapo's uh, posts and Government 2.0. He's got some very interesting posts on Mashable.com. But S3 is looking at how government can take advantage of the energy you know, velocity and talent out there in the private sector. If I had a couple of recommendations, I'd have government train senior people that this kind of social software is important. It's not static. If you don't use it, you are going to fall behind and with national security ramifications in this space. Second of all, you've got to encourage your employees to use it, not just senior people and not just behind closed enclaves. Encourage your people to get out there and understand what this world is because a lot of the people coming behind us are going to be there. And then finally, we need to seriously work to understand the security implications of this, security with a small s, so just what risks are we putting ourselves at if we start using this. We know there are risks if we don't. Um, and the, what I would suggest is looking at ways to get NSA or DIFs or uh, NIST or something to bin these into some categories. These are okay to use anywhere. These you can never use. These you can use in protected enclaves. These you can use with guidance. Something like that so we can get people to use it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well done. Wow. You guys are terrific. I think there's a virtue sitting right behind the speaker in terms of getting them to mind the clock. They're awesome. Um, and a great description there of the perils of the Internet. And between the two, uh, Linton, Linton's presentation, Duncan, I think we get a good sense of the perils and the promise, certainly at least from the perspective inside the Beltway. And we're going to go outside the Beltway now here to New York City where John Kelly is the chief research scientist and the founder of Morningside Analytics a company that's dedicated to taking our understanding of online discourse to a whole new level through some fascinating analysis techniques, and he's going to speak about them in a minute. As the Morningside webpage tells us, we take you far beyond hits or page views, uncovering who is listening to whom, why they are interested, and how ideas move among and between different audiences, even how messages are framed and reframed as they travel online. So John, take it away. We're going to dim the lights for John here to um, show his slides. A very thoughtful uh, thing to do. You can move it up here. Okay. So I have the uh, uh oh the unenviable task of trying to say what the uh, some of the most advanced internet research methodology has to say about the global internet for the whole world in 10 minutes. Uh, so let me start just by kind of hopefully wowing you with some pretty dots. Uh, so uh, you're going to see a lot of pretty dots, and the 10 minutes means we're going to go quickly through a lot of slides, a lot of visuals, going to tickle your eyeballs, and hopefully you'll remember some of it later. And if you have questions, uh, please talk to me. Uh, this is a uh, three-dimensional social network diagram of the Indian and Pakistani blogospheres. 
Uh, the two large groupings you see at the top are English language blogs, which dominate bloggers in, uh, or the dominant, uh, is the dominant blog blogging language for both Pakistan and India. And under them, down at the bottom there, you see a big swath of Hindi. You can also look around there and see the other vernacular languages of India and Pakistan. Sindhi, uh, Urdu is the red thing coming around there now. Uh, but this is the kind of work we do to take all of the uh, linking that bloggers do, which ref reflects interests, uh, uh, what their uh, information they're spreading, the stuff that the messages that they want to move, and make those um, visible to both analysis and understanding. Uh, so, a quick little joke. Uh, someone in an online forum asked, which is worse, ignorance or apathy? And the top response was, I don't know, and I don't care. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, fortunately, this is not the dominant sort of activity you find on the internet. The truth is that people who write, who blog, who participate in online social media do care, and they are not apathetic, and they are certainly not ignorant, although sometimes what, they're, what they believe uh, can't even be dangerous, as has been mentioned before. Uh, we're going to go through so fast through this stuff, I want to prime you with my conclusions at the beginning. Uh, we face a new architecture of public communications. We are going from the old hub-and-spoke model of, main, of mainstream or mass media, a few megaphones and a lot of listeners, to something called the networked public sphere. It is a completely different mode of public communications, which is already take, uh, changing politics and communication in the U.S., and will sweep the world. Uh, this network features local global scaling. Media markets make less and less sense. The most remote uh, blogger in Afghanistan is three or four hops away from the daily costs. Uh, we have complex regional, national, sub, and transnational networks that form around bloggers. Uh, blogging groups do not map onto nationalities or other known features except partly. The role of the legacy media is changing as uh, new actors enter the communicative stage, and we see citizen media, NGOs, and all kinds of other folks competing on the inter uh, uh, I'm sorry, communicating on the internet in a common medium of hyperlinked discourse. The fact of increasing connectivity around the world and the youth of the people using it and the technology skills they are adopting mean that these public networks are going to grow by orders of magnitude. This will get big fast, as it did in the United States with the blogosphere, as it has in South Korea, so will it soon in other places. And that's very important because we need to think about, as these networks grow, the shape, like the expanding universe, the shape they end up with has a lot to do with the initial conditions uh, uh, when they start growing. Uh, so our goals will be to promote a healthy, transparent, and actionable network public sphere. So now some more colorful dots, and we're going to go through a lot of these fast. These are social network diagrams of the network public spheres of uh, 12 different countries. Uh, let me stick with the premise that crosstalk is good. You don't want the neo-Nazis off in a corner bubbling around with the like-minded folks. You need people to uh, be exposed to other ideas and to talk to each other even when they disagree, especially when they disagree. If crosstalk is good, the shape of the network itself, and we're looking at 12 languages here, the shapes of these clusters are formed by the uh, linking patterns of the people participating. These clusters are networks of densely uh, connected informational communities where ideas travel fast. They travel less fast between them. So the very shape of the network, aside from the behavior of any individual blogger, has implications for how these societies process information and how information spreads there. The structures at the top, if crosstalk is what you want, clearly good. At the bottom, maybe not so much. Quick look at the Iranian blogosphere. First, to describe the methodology a little bit, every dot here represents a blog. Uh, imagine there's a wind, a force, of, or a force moving all the dots to the edge of this map. Any two blogs that are connected by linking to each other are pulled together as though by a spring or force of gravity, and so these network neighborhoods curdle up around people that are sharing links and information more quickly. That arises typically around things that they're interested in common. We also look at what these bloggers link to. Only about 35% of links are to other blogs that are linking to mainstream media, NGOs, all kinds of other stuff. So we cluster the bloggers by everything that they look at to find these informational communities and how they play a role uh, in the larger information economy. Here's the Iranian blogosphere, and you can see uh, different, these groups of interest. In the top left there are poets. We didn't expect to find them. Poetry is big in Iranian culture. But the players you would expect uh, uh, are on the lower left, the sort of secular Democrats, the folks that oppose the regime. 
On the right, surprisingly complicated and robust uh, religious Islamist blogosphere in Iran. Uh, some of them focused on politics, the red ones there. Uh, the others focused on more religious matters. Uh, there's a 70-page paper you can download from Harvard's website if you want to read about this. Just Google Iranian blogosphere and John Kelly, you'll find it. Uh, you can see Ahmadinejad and Katami's website there. The critical point here is that sometimes opponents are well-connected. Their views are represented online and they mix it up, as they do in Iran. Uh, by the way, this is the, these are the bloggers that use the word America, talking about America. And you can also use these maps to see what folks are talking about in different places. Everybody talks about Islam. The people that talk about Evan Prison in Tehran are the people that might have to go there. And the people that talk about the Mahdi, the 12th Imam, are the people that actually expect he's coming back soon. Uh, by the way, you might say, well, Iran blocks the internet. Well, it does. The ones on the left side are the blogs that are blocked inside Iran. The ones on the right are the ones that are visible. So even when governments try to block these networks, most of it is visible. Pakistan may be an exception. Here's, by contrast, the Afghan blogosphere. Uh, it looks different, we notice from the shape, and it's a different configuration of clusters. Uh, interestingly enough, Dari and Pashtu is mixed. Uh, most of these bloggers live in Kabul. Uh, and if you notice in the bottom there are some Taliban websites, and the key point here is that they are completely disconnected, almost completely disconnected from the blogosphere. The Afghan blogosphere pays no attention to the Taliban. There is only one connection. If we activate the, the links and look at them, it's a little dark, I apologize. There actually is a link connecting the Taliban up to the rest of the bloggers, except it goes through an Arabic blogger blogging from the Middle East. So this is the first place to make the point that these are global networks, where it's an Arabic blogger uh, paying attention to the Taliban who are actually connecting it to the other Afghan bloggers. Very interesting. Uh, these are, by the way, uh, uh, Afghan bloggers talk, who, who use the word pa uh, Taliban. And they're the ones that use George W. Bush. So we can see what they're talking about. And they're more concerned with our current president than with the Taliban, uh, interestingly enough. So um, here's where it gets really interesting. We take in the right-hand side there, that big group you see, those are those same Afghan bloggers. And now we looked at the ones that they connect to in the United States on the left there. So there's these, this is reinforcing the idea that these are global networks. So we have Afghan bloggers connected mostly to military in, uh, and INGO bloggers, some intel bloggers. Uh, in the US. But notice at the top there, a group of Balochi bloggers, mostly uh, separatists uh, who would like independence from the countries that actually they inhabit now. Uh, they are as densely connected to the Afghan blogosphere as are uh, American bloggers. Now it gets really interesting. On the right, you see Afghan bloggers. And on the left, you see those same clusters from the Iranian blogosphere. Uh, they're kind of nestled in there. We activate the links. And look at that. It is not unfair to say that the Afghan blogosphere is a satellite of the Iranian blogosphere. These are dense connections by which information, opinions, attitudes flow. Match that with the connection to the U.S. blogosphere. Keeping in mind, of course, that Dari is a flavor of Persian that uh, is mutually intelligible. Uh, so these networks also form around cultural things, things that don't have a lot to do or care much about national borders. Uh, so how does this interact with the media? Local news gets big play. Here we're just seeing uh, two different news outlets and who uh, uh, links to them in these two blogospheres. Uh, the BBC, the biggest trusted source, has a similar uh, spread, not quite as big. But look at the Voice of America, not doing quite so well. So BBC, VOA, and now look at YouTube. Uh, YouTube, uh, uh, Wikipedia, these new social distributed media platforms have the reach in the global blogosphere of the BBC. Uh, they are growing fast. And what's holding them back is bandwidth, not demand. Now, blogospheres are all different sizes. We've got gigantic ones like the US. We've got uh, medium-sized ones like Iran. We've got tiny little ones like Afghanistan. But keeping in mind that there is a tremendous uh, uh, network of, of global connections that uh, uh, bring in other kinds of actors uh, you can't reduce to a nation. So think of the Balochis and now mag uh, multiply that by 20 for all the different regional ethnic uh, little blogospheres, a lot of them agitating for separation that are networked in with these national sites. So now let's return quickly to uh, our first map we were looking at in 3D, now in 2D. So we have, uh, considering uh, very topical, Pakistan and India, what would you do looking at this map? I guarantee you that there are people here with outra that are presenting outrageous conspiracy theories about the Mumbai attacks. There are people who are beating the drums of war, and there are people who are playing the pipes of peace, all out there, as well as talking about cricket and cooking recipes. So, there's a lot that's going on here, and understanding how to actually use it for peace building uh, requires a lot of intelligence, and let me just make a few points. 
Uh, I think the first thing that uh, sh people should try and do is understand that these networks can be healthy or unhealthy, and we should try and promote healthy networks. Uh, the, th the, the way they activate in times of conflict will have a lot to do with the 99.9% .9 of the time that they are not activated around conflict. So building the long-term capacity is critical. Uh, that in, it means connectivity, it means practices of the sort of training that uh, uh, Duncan was talking about. Uh, it means technology, but it also means what I'm calling oxygen, which is the kinds of ways that social capital are built through these networks, that journalists listen to bloggers, uh, that, that, that formations, uh, that, that uh, social capital can build in the way folks interact as it does here. Uh, it's important that these networks be transparent. We don't want what Linton was talking about with people running off in a corner and bubbling with their own kind, stewing in uh, the juices of their own particular uh, uh, madness. Uh, to the extent that uh, uh, these networks are public, that people with even radically divergent views must present them to, themse to uh, themselves and others, uh, I think we're better off. That requires trying to lay a foundation that includes protecting speech by these bloggers around the world, standing up for them when they're being sent to jail. It means helping to curb the censorship of the internet. And it means building a range of trusted sources of information who can be linked to and build that trust as part of the capacity of the network over time. And lastly, we want this network to be actionable. And by actionable, I mean that we don't want to just look at it without any power to uh, act. But we want ourselves to be able to monitor it, to understand it, to interact with it, and to enable other third-party players, NGOs and others that are working in the field, to themselves know the local network, be engaged with it, be part of the capacity building so that when something happens, they're there, they're connected, they know each other, they trust each other, they know where to go for good information. It's groundwork that has to be laid before uh, a crisis hits, not thought about when it does hit. Uh, so monitoring engaging is my final point. Wow. Now, how many of you would ever have guessed there were 60,000 active Persian language blogs? I mean, that's an amazing number. Thank you, John. Um, I know folks have lots of questions for our three panelists. Please keep them, you know, as I said, jot them down. After Ivan, we're going to go to questions here, but that's why we're sort of moving right across the tables to, um, to uh, uh, finish the presentations up front, and then we'll have plenty of time for questions. Ivan, um, Ivan. now, many of these guys are bloggers. Many of you are bloggers. But Ivan is the only one I know that actually makes a living blogging. Um, he is the executive director of an organization known as Global Voices, a coalition of citizen journalists and bloggers in 150 countries, which began as a project at Harvard Law, School, uh, Harvard Law School's um, Berkman Center for Internet and Society. And before Global Voices, Ivan spent 10 years working in media development, former Soviet Union in Asia, supporting and training journalists and working on media co-production. So he knows what of he speaks. Ivan? Thank you, Sheldon. It's always a, it's always a pleasure to follow John Kelly because he's pretty much covered everything. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a couple of quick points to add that address specifically issues of countries and conflict. Um, when we think about the, uh, say, 60 countries that we generally categorize in the world as weak or fragile states, um, and think about how conflict occurs um, in those environments whereby you've got uh, weak governance, lots of political movements, lots of instability, um, traditionally that has been an environment where there is a scarcity of information. And we've approached conflict in the way that we manage media from that perspective and from that lens. And what this has shown us very clearly is that we have a paradigm shift towards an abundance of media, an abundance of communication technologies that we're looking at today in many countries and in the next 10 or 15 years will be true everywhere, including in those countries that we consider today weak and fragile. So Somalia has five cell phone networks and good internet connections um, and, that, and no government. That is a model that we need to, a, a mindset that we need to absorb. Afghanistan per John's map, four years ago had no bloggers. Today there's 400,000 internet users there and a, 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 a trunk line is being built around the country and we'll see massive growth of internet use and expansion there and, and the cycles of technology mean that this, the, the pace of growth and adaptation will increase 
from what we've seen rather than slow. So we should expect a future whereby conflict takes place amidst communications abundance. Um, enough on structure. I've been asked today to talk about, specifically about how people use digital media in and around conflict. We talk about bloggers, but um, Sheldon's asked me to explain who they are and who, who is actually using media in this kind of context. So I want to start by saying that in many, in many conflicts, in complex emergencies uh, and significant political upheavals in the past few years, citizen media has played a very significant role in providing information of all sorts um, beyond the mainstream media for the past three years. So we look at Lebanon, we look at, in 2006, we look at uh, Pakistan um, political upheavals in 2007 or Burma in 2007 or Kenya in, at the end of at the end of 2007 and early 2008. And we see again and again that citizen media are not just informing, they are also being used as a tool for mobilization um, and activization for people who have an interest in the outcome of conflict. And so a mind shift there is that media is not just a fun have, does not just have a functional relationship to conflict, it is actually an element in it. It is, a, it is the space or the ground on which conflict is playing out. Um, a couple of quick points on the perception and expectations of citizen media. Um, here we often think of bloggers as people who are, who are producing a lot of comment and a lot of hype and a lot of noise and anger around, and we talk of it as divisive. But in contexts outside of the United States, especially in, um, in regimes that are, are countries where there may be uh, controlled press or autocracies, uh, mainstream media are not necessarily the source of free and unbiased, unbiased information, not even true in the U.S. And in that context, citizen media can play a really, really important role for producing good information because the media, the mainstream media, is not doing it itself. It's a force of propaganda. So it's a different mental uh, approach to that as well. And, and, and citizen media and the abundance of media here provides access for voices for those people, for public intellectuals, for independent voices that did not, simply did not exist before. Specifically now looking at the question of um, how people are using media in conflict zones. Of course we have the incidental question. So an event occurs, somebody is there and takes a picture of it. So uh, the U.S. military bombed Azizabad in western Afghanistan. Um, there was a dispute over the number of people killed. Uh, an Afghan who was local had a cell phone, took a picture, took a video on his camera, shared that video with the New York Times. That video went up and it caused a huge ruckus in, in globally in terms of civilian casualties in the Afghan war. Um, that's the incidental model. The second is uh, the fact of the public network sphere that John was talking about. People are doing things in their own time, their own effort, and as conflict occurs in their community, they shift the focus of what they're doing to work on that. And there's, that's a, an example of a partial attention relationship to conflict. People are not, it's not a question of building institutions to be involved, but a question of, of incidental um, attention. The third and the, the issue that I'm going to focus the rest of my time and talk on the talk today is about people or initiatives that focus specifically on using media, using citizen media and digital media to approach issues of peace and conflict. And um, uh, this is, a, this is a, a place where we'll start to see that um, people are trying not just to say what's occurring in the world, but also to understand, to analyze and contextualize information, to create metadata or databases, to map conflict, to try to help early war to create early warning systems so that people can use information to effectively get out of the way of conflict or to help tamp it down if they know it's occurring. So the very questions, of, for instance, of early warning for genocide, early warning for um, in local communities as well. I'd like to point out that these are often citizen-led initiatives. The, the, the focus, for, uh, the, the motivation from them often comes from the ground. It doesn't come from above. It comes from people who have technology access and skills and say, I want to do something to help my community and do so. So I have a couple of examples for you and I'll see if I can get through them in my time. Um, this is an example of a Sri Lankan uh, citizen media project called Ground Views that focuses specifically on, uh, on creating p uh, p amplifying peace and, uh, and, um, and anti-conflict news and information. It was created by a, a young man named Sinjana Hatatoa, who's a uh, Sinhalese, who saw an opportunity to use his technological skills to 
um, to amplify this question in the Sri Lankan blogosphere. And in two years of, of running this project, he's, um, he's basically created a mainstream media outlet, more or less by himself, and to the point where he's able to do videos, in this case, of, uh, of a, a, a prominent government official who is who's, uh, now has a platform to talk about his views on peace and violence. Um, Ground Views is part of an initiative that, uh, of a number of Sri Lankan organizations to use digital media technologies to monitor election violence. And they use this by training a number of uh, citizen journalists and, and citizen media to, to observe polling places uh, and then using SMS texting send messages back to the Center for Elec Monitoring Election Violence who then post, post the issue uh, as it occurs, and they, use, they have a vetting mechanism. So this is an example of saying, we have the technology and we need to focus it specifically to answer a question or solve a problem. Um, this is ushahidi.com. It's a project created by uh, a group of three Kenyan bloggers um, who, at the end of 2007, saw an opportunity to use their knowledge to try to create better information around the post-election violence. Um, and they, they simply they set up a simple mechanism to allow people to SMX, SMS uh, incidents or, or call in incidents around their communities. Um, and then they, they categorized them and posted them and created a timeline of events. Um, Ushahidi, again, is a totally local, totally local initiative. Um, this is a map that was created by a group called the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative to study Ushahidi and to, and to compare the accuracy of the information they produce with uh, national uh, and international media who are also reporting on Kenya and, um, and citizen media reports. And in, in, in a nutshell, they found that not one of those sources produced anything other than anecdotal information, but only Ushahidi was able to present complete, completely contextualized and, and uh, uh, contextualized and, and location-sensitive information on a regular basis. So both the citizen media and the mainstream media failed about one-third of, one of the time to actually present useful or accurate information. And, and this kind of project was able to do so more, more clearly. Um, Ushahidi then went on to become a, a, uh, an organization that wants to take the software around the world. And they, they won a number of awards. And this is now their home page. And uh, they, this technology has recently uh, been adapted in Gaza this, with Al Jazeera using their, their technological application to map uh, conflict using the Twitter sites that you were talking about to actually put it on, on record. And so what we're seeing is a citizen initiative that is, being, that is directed specifically to say, how do we get better information out of a conflict? And this is only in the course of a year. These guys started this a year ago. And, uh, and it's still pretty primitive, but it's a lot better than what was being done. So um, last group, this is Global Voices. This is the organization that I, I work for. Um, it's an organization of about, about uh, 250 volunteers and editors who try to context who translate and contextualize blogs and citizen media and, and Twitter and other types of social media for around the world to try to explain or place um, uh, in a, in a larger context, the community, the, 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 and make sense of what we see in, in, the, in the blogospheres that John's been presenting to us. And uh, this is a, very much a, a matter of saying that um, serendipity or the, the experience of, of understanding how the rest of the world thinks is something that we can actually engineer. It's not just a matter of saying, well, look, we, we, we hate over here, and you guys have a separate group over there. It's, that is actually a choice that we have, because it's not necessarily a technological issue. It's a human issue. And this is an attempt to answer that. And some of the things we do really quickly um, uh, is we focus very much on, on breaking news and special and uh, issues that maybe don't have great coverage by international journalists. So, and every time that happens, we do a special page. I'm almost done. This is a, a special page from Mumbai an example of what we do. Um, this is an example of a story from Gaza recently, and it's relevant. Um, and it's about a story of about two, two bloggers, one in Sidera and one in Gaza, who are talking to each other. And uh, just an example of how to, how to emphasize those stories. In the last story, the last slide, this is the page of those two bloggers. Um, and, and an example, again, of people saying, we ourselves think that we can make a change. Um, I'm probably about out of time. 
Um, so I'm going to, I'll defer, do you want me to defer my comments, my recommendations? Sure. Or go on? Sure. Defer them? Okay. Excellent. Thank you, Ivan. <laughs> Super. Well, now you have a good sense of who the blogger is as well. We have really covered the waterfront in the last hour here. Um, we've talked about conflict prevention online through online discourse. We've talked about conflict in incitement. We've talked about mapping the blogosphere. And now the view of the bloggers themselves on this brave new medium. Um, and I'm sure there are lots of questions out there. We have folks with microphones. OK. So we've got a couple of minutes for questions. Before I take them, let me remind you, questions only, please no speeches, uh, so we can get as many in the, in the time that we have left, get as many in there. Um, President Truman once was said to have told a questioner, um, please, who went on too long, he said, please be clear, be direct, and be seated. So if we can observe <laughs> his mandate, it would be useful. Um, first question, right here, we've got a microphone. Hi, I'm, uh, sorry? Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I'm Cynthia Schneider. I work, hi Sheldon. Yeah. I work at uh, Georgetown University in the Brookings Institution. Thank you so much. What a fascinating, fascinating panel. I have a question, maybe mostly for John and, and Ivan, about whether this exists already or the potential, or, or no, maybe it's for everybody, for the potential of um, social networks forming in a kind of positive way around uh, cultural phenomenon people entities, such as, for example, around music, like around hip hop music, around you know, fashion, around sports figures or whatever. I mean, we know that young people who are attracted to extremist groups, it's not necessarily they're more religious, it's just a thing to belong to. So are there things like that to, that belong to around cultural icons or could there be and how would that work? And I mean internationally, like crossing different uh, borders. Um, go. So I've, I've actually got one uh, uh, response to that, which uh, brings in something Lenton said earlier about the way that some of the jihadi sites use music, which is if you look at uh, Iranian blogs or blogs in a lot of parts of the world, they all use music, not just the jihadi ones. Uh, the poetry blogs use music. So there are cultural practices of, of, of self-identity uh, uh, presentation and involvement in cultural practices that end up online. And being sensitive to those and understanding what they are can under help you understand better uh, both how to do, I think, some of what you're talking about, which is to organize positive uh, speech around cultural stuff. And I think that's a great idea. You see, especially in Afghanistan, uh, the Afghan blogs and the Iranian blogs, a mixture of poetry and politics. People write, I mean, think about Afghanistan. People write poetry about the news and that poetry ends up in villages being sung. It's like a Homeric tradition, and it's one of the ways that information spreads in Afghanistan. So being sensitive to the cultural context, and especially how other kinds of uh, cultural practices are involved in the spreading of information and how that gets hooked in online is a really a key thing to pay attention to. Thanks, Cynthia. Next question here. Do we have a Hi, my name is Claudine Schweber. I'm at the University of Maryland, University College. Um, someone had said something about um, the importance of visualness, or it had been, of seeing. I'm wondering if you have examples of uh, groups, you, individuals or groups using things, you know, using Skype or other visual medium to communicate with each other so they can actually get closer and see in a way that is positive, or is it mostly text-based? Um. Go ahead, Ab. Um, visual, visual. For, well, first of all, the the main question is bandwidth. Um, outside of so, when where there is actual capa technical capacity for for video and, and audio, people use it. Um, and and video sharing sites are incredibly popular, and so is, and, and and image sharing sites are as well. So, um, whether that that can be translated into what I would recommend is that th those be elements if you're trying to build a project. Those be elements that you systematically try to put into your, into your, into your, into your work because people certainly are interested in visual cues and, and, and sharing, as long as you're sensitive to the bandwidth issue. John, in your mapping, do you distinguish between video, text-based, um, online discourse? 
Well, we do. I mean, uh, all the stuff you're seeing are the maps of the discussion spaces, and actually a lot of the work we do is looking at what those discussion spaces are talking about and what, what media they're using. Uh, so obviously, pictures are very important. Um, the bandwidth key thing is key, however, because a lot of places, the, you know, in fact, in Iran, the government has throttled back the available bandwidth to consumers because they were too worried about YouTube and things like that. So uh, you have to sort of be bandwidth con con uh, conscious. But as bandwidth increases, and it will increase, it is increasing, the richer media become much more important. Uh, I think one of the most remarkable things we see around the world is the use of YouTube. Uh, I mean, if you look at all the YouTube videos that are popular in the Iranian blogosphere, uh, for instance, there is amazing content there. Content on sugarcane workers uh, rioting in, in, in the provinces, uh, clerics on stage saying very odd things, uh, people making uh, ad hoc music videos in downtown Tehran criticizing the government. It's amazing stuff that the citizens themselves are creating, and that will increase as uh, the bandwidth increases. Lynn? Just one important session I was at about a year ago was on strategic listening just to follow up the point you made. And you know, the American way of communication, strategic communication often is transmit. And the richness of what's out there in these other societies suggests we ought to step back for a little bit and just listen to what they're saying to themselves and trying to tell us before we decide what message we're going to deliver. Uh, microphone over there. Terrific panel. Um, you talk a lot about Facebook, about YouTube, about individual blogs. But where is the impetus for an open, branded platform for public diplomacy? Hmm. Duncan? Um, it's working, yeah. We do have a platform called America.gov, which is a platform where we tried to be more Web 2.0 than we were previously. It includes video, it includes some blogging, it includes reader and uh, audience feedback, asking them to participate. It includes a lot more video. We, we, we produce now our own YouTube type, three minute and under videos on things as, as, as varied as how, how Americans celebrate Ramadan to how entrepreneurship works among youth. So there's lots of things like that. Um, that's a good, that's a platform, and I think that's an important way that we do it. We also have straight blogging. There, in many of the world, places of the world, like in the Arab world, there's not that many bloggers, but there's a lot of discussion forums that are platforms where you'll, they'll have thousands of people logging on to discuss things from movies to international affairs. We go to those forums because they are where the, where the audience is. Um, let's come over this side, and then we'll come back to that side. We've been over here for a while. Hi, um, my name is Mary Leopold. I work for a, an organization called Peace by Peace that was founded in 2002 before there was the term social networking and what we're all about is creating that space for citizen diplomacy, for women uh, particularly to, to connect on the basis of differences, not on the basis of similarities, and then learn to care about each other and find the differences. So it does exist. I don't want to take up more time than that, but it's www.piecebypiece, spelled P-E-A-C-E-X-P-E-A-C-E dot -E -E org. All right. This has been a public service announcement. <laughs> Let's take the mic. Thank you, Mary. Let's take it over here, Susan. Right here, Anna. Oh, there you go. Hi, my name is Susan Abbott, and I'm from the Annenberg School for Communication. And my question um, is about branding and diplomacy. And I wondered what the panelists had to say about their experiences of US branding and the outgoing administration and incoming administration, and whether you might consider doing more strategic partnerships and thinking about how messages are imparted in countries where the U.S. may not be so popular, yet diplomacy is still quite relevant. How do you get around the branding issue? Duncan, I think that's your bailiwick yeah, I there. think um, there was discussion, there has been discussion of is there a U.S. brand, and the answer is no, we're not a product. We, we, but we, when, you know, you have an administration, any administration has its, has its policies, but America, for foreigners, particularly in what we're trying to promote is America as a set of ideals, as a culture, as, as not a political agenda. But what we want to get back to is what we had in the 50s and 60s, which is America representing 
something positive to the world with a with the ability to be a positive and a player and and bring a I you know a, a, um, a vision that people want to subscribe to and I think that's been missing recently uh, for a number of years and it's not it's just because of, you know when you become the sole superpower you get a lot of negativity attached to that but we need to move back to becoming a place where people see as a positive force in the world and that can, that can be done and we are a positive force we haven't changed I think in many ways but one of our jobs is to describe America as a whole you know as as a complex culture so all right we're bumping up against lunch we got time for just two quick ones here uh, could I have a microphone up here and then one back there I'm Kate Cowan with the Academy for Educational Development, uh, Center for Civil Society and Governance. And I'm wondering about connectivity. For example, in Chad or other countries, areas like that, um, what do you see in terms of time frame, development of that connectivity to be able to take advantage of these kinds of uh, new media? Is anybody who wants to jump in on this one? Well, just really quickly, I'll say the, the computer for uh, the, the next generation is the cell phone. Right. And we'll have connectivity uh, via cellular ne networks for, um, for Chad, for the regions that you're talking about before mm -hmm. we have internet connectivity. I just want to make a, an auxiliary point, though, uh, which is that you don't have to wait until there's con connectivity and a lot of citizenry online to uh, try to understand and appreciate the difference that uh, these networks are already making. Uh, keeping in mind that, say, bloggers, for instance, or other participants online, a lot of what they're doing is informing journalists. Uh, so particularly, uh, so certainly true for the U.S., and maybe in some cases more true for countries where it's fewer pop of the population online and it's more of the elite online, is that those elite are also the journalists. So they are still key points in the transmission of information that goes out through other media. So just like the Telegraph, no one ever got their news directly from the Telegraph except Abraham Lincoln in the Civil War. But the Telegraph revolutionized the news business without actually being a consumer medium. Good point. Last question. Yeah, I'm Claudia Agnasso at the State Department and I'm from the Africa Bureau. You scooped my question over there when you asked about Chad. So I'll slip to my second one and, and that is, what's the difference in terms of the connectivity or what you're seeing in the blogosphere vis-a-vis uh, -vis North Africa and Sub-Saharan Africa? Of course, we don't have the bandwidth a lot of times in Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, yeah, I think actually Ivan knows more about that. Um, I mean, Bandwidth is mo in Africa is mainly concentrated in cities, first of all. So um, I would say, obviously, in Sub-Saharan Africa and South Africa and a few other places, you have very high bandwidth. And um, South Africa is, ver is very much a hub for internet use in the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, in the north, um, Morocco, Tunisia, uh, Egypt are, um, are very active. And, uh, and so, and um, so, I think I would I would focus less on, on that environment and look specifically at, at at sectors or centers of technological innovation and resources. And all right, I'm getting the high sign that we're bumping up against. Uh, we've had good food for thought, but now we've got food for the stomachs <laughs> coming up here. Um, let me thank everyone for attending. Yeah. And I realize we've only scratched the surface here. We've gone very broad. We will be going very deep at the institute. Um, at, in our centers of innovation where we are actively studying this topic. So thank you all for coming today and thank you to our panelists. <laughs>